virtually every part of our lives is controlled by our ability to harness electricity and then let it come out at the right time. And what are we dependent on? We are dependent on chemicals to harness the electricity for us. So this week, we're going to explore this idea of chemicals harnessing electricity and then spilling it out at the right time. This is called electrochemistry. And this is yet another one of these parts that these topics that I can cover with you, but I can't cover with honors chemistry. So you get the benefit. Why are surface treatments so important to us? What are surface treatments? Well, your coins. Your coins on the surface are going to have typically a thin film of zinc or maybe copper. Why? Because zinc and copper is too expensive to make the whole coin out of. We want it to look silvery or we want it to look coppery, but we can't afford for the whole thing to look that way. And what are we looking at? We're looking at the surface of the coin. So why not put on the surface a thin film of that which we want to see and make the rest of the coin something that's cheap, something that's worth about a penny. See, the whole problem with the penny started about... It's getting almost close to 100 years ago. We used to have pure penny, uh, uh, pure copper pennies back in the uh, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, and very early in the 80s. And during that time, the price of copper started going up to the point that finally in the late 70s, a penny was no longer worth a penny in copper. People were melting copper pennies and then selling it to other people for much more than a penny okay in order to stop that our mint realized that we could not make any more copper pennies but everyone was used to the coppery look on the penny so what they did is they put a thin film a surface treatment on zinc pennies which could be made for about a penny, a penny. But it was still, it still looked like a penny. So every penny you've dealt with that has been post-1982, I think, uh, has been a copper-coated penny, zinc penny, copper-coated zinc penny. There are three forms of the soft uh, surface treatments. They are coatings, platings, and thin films, coatings, platings, and thin films. You are used to coatings the most. That's what we call paints. So the wall is coated with a paint. Paints, varnishes, shellacs. Look down on the floor. Notice that there's parts of the floor that are really shiny. And there's parts of the sh floor that's scuffed. Well, the parts of the floor that are scuffed are around where your chairs are. Why? Because since the beginning of the year, you guys have been scuffing the coating that they have put that they placed on my floor right before you came. Notice also that oftentimes, as soon as you walk through the school for the first time, you'll notice the floors are shiny and they look new. That is because while you were not here to ruin everything. The custodians put a new coating on the floor. But what happens to all coatings over time? They get worn away. Yeah. So here are some coatings on this beautiful Harley Davidson. Wherever you see just the different colors, those are probably coatings. Coatings. Now, the chrome here may not be a coating. It may be a plating where they took a much cheaper metal that doesn't look very nice, and they plate it with a very pretty looking metal that will be shiny and new looking. Why? Because, you know, if you're gonna buy a nice, expensive Harley Davidson, you want it to look shiny. 
used to be once upon a time that the bumpers used to be just pure metal. Not anymore. Now it is probably a some kind of plastic with a coating on top of some sort. A, a metallic coating. Is coating an example of a physical or chemical change? Think about it. All we're doing is just putting stuff on top of other stuff. So that would mean it's a physical change. It sinks into the pores without actually reacting with the substance it coats. All right, there are three types of paints, three parts to a paint. The pigment, anybody know what the pigment gives us? The color, very good. The solvent and the resin. Does anyone know what the solvent gives us? Okay, so when they painted these walls, what was the form of the paint? It's a liquid. It was a pigment and a resin that was dissolved in a solvent. So the solvent is the liquid that it comes in. So they sprayed it, probably they sprayed it on there. These days, if we want to paint it, we have to use a uh, uh, probably a paintbrush. But the people who came through when they were when they were uh, building this building, they probably didn't have time to paintbrush it, so they spray painted it. So the liquid fell on there, leaving the resin and the pigment sitting on the liquid. What happens when the liquid comes out, when it evaporates out? What's left behind? The resin and the pigment. Resin, what do you think the resin does? What's the job of the resin? If the solvent gives us the ability to stick it on there, what does the resin do? Close. Nope. What does the pigment give paint? Color. What does the solvent give paint? Its ability to be applied. And what does the resin give paint? Its protective properties. If it wasn't for the resin, you could probably dig your, your nails in there and chip off the pigment but the resin allows it to stick much more tenaciously onto the wall. What has been the problem with paints over the years? Some of the solvents that we used proved to be harmful. That's why you will see professional painters that do this all day long, they will be wearing a, a mask. Because for all, those of us who may paint once a year, once every two years, or whatever, that's okay. But if you're doing it every day, those, harmful, those solvents can be harmful. How has the problem with solvents been partially taken care of? By powder coatings. Now, we can't do this with the walls of a school, but with bumpers, with bicycle frames, with a lot of what you deal with, we can. What is a powder coating? Basically, take a nice shiny metal bicycle. Sometimes they're, they may not even be completely metal. They're a composite of carbon and, and, uh, and metal in order to make it as light as possible. Clean it, the product we paint it, and then ground it. What that means is you take some wires and you hook it up to a, a place where the electricity can leave. Grounding gives electricity a place to go. Electricity does not is, is made up of a bunch of electrons. And when the electrons accumulate, they get really, really upset with each other. And if you do not allow electrons to go somewhere, then electric arcs will occur. Lightning bolts will come out of it out of the things. All right, so you mix the powder with compressed air. Has anyone ever seen this happen? Has anyone ever seen a car being painted? This is how they're gonna do it. Pump it into a spray gun. Give it electric charge. So now, whatever you're wanting to paint on there, whatever you're wanting to paint has electricity running through it. 
and it's grounded so the electricity has somewhere to go. Coat the, powder, the product with the powder. What happens is because that bike frame is now negatively charged, as soon as you start spraying it, the pigment sticks to it because it's negatively charged. The gun is going to make the pigment positively charged. So what you want to do is you want to now, and if you you know what I'm talking about, if you've ever seen a car being painted, it has to be baked. It's usually in a in a special type of uh, of room where the car sits there, and then they turn on these uh, these very hot lamps, and it's baked on there. If not, then it, the the coating comes off. In order to get these bikes powder coated, you need electrochemistry. What is electrochemistry? The study of all cool things electrons can do when they're liberated from an atom. Without electrons streaming into that bike frame, without electrons streaming into your car, this doesn't work. This doesn't work. Two practical applications for electrochemistry, electroplating and batteries, electroplating and batteries. What is electroplating? The process of using electricity to deposit metal ions onto a metal. That's how we get that thin film of copper on a zinc penny. To fool us into thinking that it's copper when really it is a zinc penny. The act of electroplating is called electrolysis. Electrolysis. Now comes very important pieces of information. Some vocabulary that you must become familiar with. What does it mean for a metal to be oxidized? It loses electrons. That's it. It loses electrons. So if copper is going about its business and then it burps out two electrons, it has been oxidized. What you need to remember is oil rig. Oxidation is losing electrons. So if something is oxidized, it loses electrons. So if you are a giver-upper of electrons, you are an oxidizer. you're walking down an aisle somewhere and you go, oh, I feel like I need to lose two electrons. You're an oxidizer.
If you go to the bathroom and two electrons come out, you have been oxidized. Oil rig, oxidation is losing. Reduction is gaining. Okay, so if somebody loses electrons, somebody has to gain them. So reduction means to gain electrons. So if you're going down about your business, you've already lost two electrons, and then somebody comes up to you and says, here, take two electrons. They just reduced you. They just reduced you. Oxidation is losing. Reduction is gaining. Oil rig. Oil rig. What are some examples? Metal bumpers. They're no longer metallic. There are usually some kind of plastic. Bumpers are no longer metallic, so they are coated with chromium and nickel. Coins. Coins. Where do the electrons come from? A battery or an electric power source. The wall. The electrons have to go some come from somewhere. How does electroplating work? And we're going to do this on Friday. You're going to experience this. Does everyone have keys, like a brass key? Make sure that by Friday you have at least one key because we're going to plate it with copper. It needs to be a brass key, and we're going to plate it with copper. We'll make it look coppery. It won't in any way affect the function of the key. Of, of the key, It will make it look coppery. So get a solution containing the dissolved ions of the kind that you want to plate. To it, you immerse a metal rod of the same kind. This is called the anode because the electron has to come from somewhere. So we're going to put in an anode an anode. Connect the anode to a battery. Connect an anode to a battery. For now, just get these words down, and then I'm going to show you some pictures that will help you understand. Did I go too fast? Did you get those? Timothy, you've got white things coming out your ears. Make them go away. Thank you. All right, so a battery has two sides. Have you noticed that? Battery has two sides. It's because there are two parts to a battery. You have the anode that produces electrons and you have the cathode that absorbs electrons. So, these electrons are going to start here with something that likes to give away electrons, and they will go into this part of the battery, forcing the electrons to come out the other side. So here comes the electrons. The electrons are now going to fill up our key. It's going to fill up our key with electrons. So the key is now going to be negatively charged. Okay, lots and lots of negatives. So what's going to happen is it's going to attract the copper ions that are released by this process, by giving up electrons. It's going to attract it, and it's going to stick to your key. So basically, we're going to move copper from this called an electrode. We're going to move it and have it stick to the other electrode, which will be your key. And I'll explain it in more detail before Friday. Connect the battery or power supply to the metal to be plated, and voila, which is actually spelled voila, but the French say voila, which means there, success. Maybe a video can help you. Oh. I went too fast. We good now? No. 
We good now? Okay, so we're adding some copper sulfate, and the copper is going to the copper sulfate is going to give us the copper ions. Here is the copper piece of metal. Here is the battery. Okay, so the copper is going to release electrons, and they're going to flow out and into the battery, pushing electrons over here. As that happens, this strip becomes negative, and it's going to attract all the copper ions, and the copper ions are going to stick to the zinc. So if this is your key, in just a few minutes, your key will be coated with copper. You can understand this. You will be able to do this because if this obnoxious little kid can do it, so can you. Watch. I love this kid, actually. He's got his own science YouTube channel. Jar, jar, kid, jar. Careful. Whoa. Okay, so basically that jar has a bunch of zinc ions, zinc plus two. Zincs who are positive. Positive zincs are in there. Don't you love this kid? Okay, this will work for your cars as well. The negative one is the one that the electrons, the electricity is coming out of. The red one, the electricity is coming back into. In order for your car battery to work, the electricity that it gets out has to eventually come back in. All right? You do not want to connect the wrong one to the wrong one because that forces the battery to go in reverse and that will create bad things. Don't don't let them touch. Don't let them touch.
Okay, remember, in order for a battery to work, all the electricity it gets out, it must bring in. So that zinc nail is going to release electrons. So it's going to resupply the battery in, in order to allow the battery to work. You got to always resupply the battery. I love that kid. All right, so what happens at the anode? Oxidation. Anode is where electrons are going to spill out of. Copper metals are going to give electrons and dissolve it into the solution. You can remember it with the acronym ANOX, red cat and ANOX. What happens to the electrons that are released at the anode? They flow into the cathode. Electrons always come out of the anode into a cathode of some sort. I believe at some point the numbering gets messed up, but it's at least consistent. What happens at the cathode? Reduction takes place. So electrons are absorbed. Red cat reduction happens at the cathode. Electrons are picked up. Is plating an example of chemical or physical change? Let's go back here. We're taking some copper We're say, taking some copper here and sticking it onto our key. Is sticking copper on a key chemical or physical change? Once again, it is a physical change. Because all we're doing is moving atoms from one place to the other. Uh, I was wrong because they actually bond with the metal to form a new thing. It's been about a year since the last time I covered this. The most common type of electrochemical battery is called a voltaic or ga galvanic cell. We're going to cover those. We're going to make those on Friday as well. What is a voltaic cell? A chemical reaction that gets electrons in a redox to work for us before they finish the reaction. We don't let them hand off electrons without them first working for us.
The most common name for a voltaic cell is a battery. Heard of batteries? Battery. What happens at the anode? At the anode, electrons come out. Electrons always come out of the anode. Usually they are electron, they're metals that are higher up on the activity series. The electrons that come out of these metals that love to be oxidized do something for us. They run our cell phones. They run our earbuds. They run our flashlights. They flow out looking for something. They flow out looking for something to reduce. And in the meantime, they run through our cell phones and our battery and our uh, flashlights and anything else that we have. What happens at the cathode? At the cathode, induction takes place, red cat. That's where electrons always come to. Electrons always leave. The anode always go back to the cathode. What does a salt bridge? Did I go too fast again? All right, there you go. I don't know how, my, how many blanks there are, so you'll just have to... Just warn me. Are we good now? Salt bridge is important because without a salt bridge, you can't get everything evened out. So a salt bridge usually is some kind of solution that contains plenty of ions that allows all the positive and negative ions to be evened out. We're going to use a salt bridge on Thursday. They're called lemons. So you will each have a lemon that you will use as a salt bridge. See, the problem is that at the cathode, too many negative, too many positive things will be created. At the anode, at the anode, too many negative things. I'm sorry, at the anode, too many positive things are created. At the cathode, too many negative things are created. Watch. All right, you guys, just chill. We've got plenty of time to put everything away, but this video will explain everything. So here at the anode, that's where electrons are made. Notice what happens. The electrons take off from these little silvery balls and then the silvery balls go into the solution. Whoa, that was not good. Let's try it again. Electrons get out into the bar and join the swirl. 
Here goes all the electrons. So here, the electrons are going to accumulate and turn it negative, and that's going to attract the copper ions to it, and they will stick to it. I did it again. And here's a neat little cartoon that explains the same thing. All right, we're done.